Welcome to the Monday, March 25th meeting of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. We meet at the Old Spaghetti Factory here in Hillsboro. Um, I am Ann Madden, and I'm a past president of the forum. Our president right now, John Tyner, just couldn't be here today, so I'm filling in for John. The Washington County Public Affairs Forum has been the premier forum in Washington County since 1956 for education in civic affairs. And we're awfully glad to see you all here today and for those who are watching us on television. Um, it is spring break, and so many of our members are on vacation. Perhaps they're cruising, who only knows? But the people we have with us today are from AAA of Oregon and Idaho, and um, uh, we have three lovely representatives from that organization, but most especially Doreen Luftborough. And Doreen is the Vice President of Travel Services and Marketing with AAA Oregon and Idaho. She leads the travel division and has duties extending from here to eternity, including um, marketing and uh, for membership, insurance, financial services, and all other, other products and services, which are legion. And before she worked for AAA, Doreen was district sales manager for Prin uh, Princess Cruises, and she's been on over 30 cruises, so I think she knows what she's talking about. Uh, Doreen has a BS in business from Portland State, and she sits on all kinds of committees, the Travel Portland Community Action Committee, the PDX International Air Service Executive Committee, the Leadership Portland Alumni Steering Committee, and the National AAA Travel Steering Committee. And in her leisure time, she enjoys travel. What a, what a surprise. And golf. So Doreen, we're happy to have you here and your colleagues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne, and thank you all for um, uh, allowing us to be here today to share some news about cruising. I, uh, as Anne mentioned, I have cruised over 30 times, and I do love to talk about travel. So uh, I thought, it, uh, what a fun time, and I have a, um, thank you for the uh, pleasure of being here. So as um, Anne read my bio, I just wanted to point out also, since we're at the Washington County Forum here, that I am an Oregonian. I uh, grew up here, and in fact, I uh, grew up in western Washington County, and there's my picture in the strawberry field on the farm back when I was about six. So, uh, so today, so a long time Was Western Washington County uh, resident. So today we're gonna talk about uh, cruising. So, and why cruising is really number one for value and relaxation. Uh, how cruising is um, really uh, offers a great value with the inclusive price and the ability to allow you to have a very relaxing, uh, re relaxing vacation with the um, unpacking once and just being able to settle in instead of, um, you know, sometimes on hotel or land vacations, you're constantly packing up and moving from one destination to another. The nice thing about a cruising is you, uh, you just get to unpack once, settle in, and enjoy your trip. So I invite you today to imagine a destination, to plan a celebration, whether it's a uh, family vacation or maybe it's uh, t taking multiple generations of your family on a vacation and to try something new. There's just about um, so many options and things. Uh, this fantastic one with the, uh, the camels on the beach in Africa. So when you're choosing a cruise, it's really about you. So the key here is there's not really a one-size-fits-all when it comes to cruising. There are so many choices for what's the right itinerary for you, what's the right ship, what activities are you interested in, of course, what fits your travel budget. Uh, it's really about you and uh, some of the options. So today we're going to go through some of these and answer some of these questions. So, where to begin? Uh, first of all, let me ask the room really quickly if I could see a show of hands, how many people have ever been on a cruise? Oh, quite a few. Okay, great, thank you. So, uh, where to begin? So, first, you, uh, choose your itinerary and destination. And I want to start by also suggesting you enlist the help of a travel professional. Keep in mind that uh, if any of you have tried 
um, using Google to search for a cruise, you might come up with about a billion responses. And it's very difficult to sort through those responses and figure out what one is really good and what one is really bad. There's no good and bad meter on Google. There's just a lot of options and a lot of choices. So we do suggest enlisting the help of a travel professional because they can provide unbiased information. They can save you time because I don't know if you've tried to sort through all those responses uh, and uh, websites, but you know it can take your hours and hours, so they can save you time. They can help find you, based on what you're looking for, they help find you the right vacation for you. So um, just a little plug there to enlist the help of a travel professional uh, when you're planning your first cruise. Uh, so choosing the itinerary and destination. Uh, we have... Uh, cruises out there that are available as short as three days and as long as three months. You can travel on a round-the-world cruise at about 100 days, 90 days to 100 days. So if you're thinking you want to just see everything and not uh, miss a single place, that's about a three-month cruise. You can also, like I said, visit uh, or cruise as short as three days. Our most popular length, so you know, is about seven to 12 days. That's the most popular length of cruise. And it uh, is usually what we recommend, even if it's your first cruise, we usually recommend a seven day cruise because a three day, unless you're just really tight on time, you don't get to see as many places. It's just not quite as good experience. Uh, we do always just a little tip here when you're planning a cruise, make sure you can add an extra day ahead of time or after because otherwise your, uh, you, know, you might um, uh, arrive to port, your flight's delayed, you cut, run short on time. So we always tell people have a worry-free vacation and plan an extra day at the beginning. You know, make sure you get there in plenty of time. So the season on when you're choosing this trip really uh, depends on where you're looking to travel. So the ships kind of follow the sun, if you want to think of it that way. So for example, Alaska cruises, Start, don't start until the middle of May, and they go until the middle of September. So if you definitely want to go to Alaska, you're in the summer months. I'm not sure that you'd want to go in the winter, winter months, but you'll go <laughs> travel to Alaska in the summer months. And, and many of the destinations are like that. The cruise lines move the ships around the world based on the current weather and seasons to make it uh, available during the prime time. So what destinations are there? North America, you uh, have options to include the Caribbean, uh, Mexico, Mexican Riviera, um, Alaska, Canada, New England. Uh, South Pacific um, can include Hawaii, Tahiti, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, Europe, Mediterranean, Northern Europe, Baltic, Exotics, Asia, South America. And of course, the river ships, river cruise ships, one of the most fastest growing uh, segments of the cruise industry right now plying the witter, uh, rivers of Europe like the Danube River, the Rhine River. Uh, and I just realized that Panama Canal is missing from the slide there, but Panama Canal is also a, one of the most popular uh, cruises we have during the winter months for North America. So you name it, the ships are um, throughout the world all uh, throughout the year depending on where you're looking to travel. So once you've figured out your length of cruise, uh, your, your preferred destination, and when you're going to go, it's time to actually pick out which ship you want to travel on and then what stateroom. So the, just when you thought you made the hardest decision, now there's even more. So there's um, a lot of choices when it comes to ships. In North America uh, region alone, there's over 220 ships cruise ships, believe it or not, out there cruising around. Uh, they go from big ships, small ships, sailing ships, um, small uh, river boats. So you can have a cruise with as few as, on a river cruise, maybe as few as 50 people. Um, you can have an ocean-going ship with as, as few as uh, maybe 200. And you can have an ocean-going ship with as many as 4,000 passengers. So there's everything in between. So uh, we suggest you really look at what you're looking for on your cruise to help you decide what ship to choose. So resort ships 
are really can be some of these really large ships. It's everything you can imagine. If you've been to Hawaii or been to a you know destination and stayed at a resort that has the you know nightly entertainment shows, uh, probably a children's center with activities, multiple pools. You're going to find it all on this resort ship as well, plus a casino. Uh, so it is uh, has everything you'd find uh, at top resorts on land on the ship. They're typically large. They're at least usually about 2,000 plus passengers. You can go uh, move into more of a luxury ship category, which is going to be a few um, uh, less passengers. So you know maybe you might only be on with 750, 1,000, 1,200 passengers. It's a really nice space ratio, and what that it's a cruise term, and what it means is the size of the ship to the number of passengers. And it's really in, uh, key to look at as you're planning a cruise. If you're concerned about how crowded a ship is going to be, look at the size of the ship and the number of passengers, and also look at the size of the uh, the number of passengers and how many crew members are on board to serve them. So look for that um, crew to passenger ratio to make sure if your service is maybe onboard service and attentive service is your number one goal, you want to make sure that the cruise line or the ship you're looking at has a high crew ratio. For people with an adventuresome spirit, there's exploration ships. These are uh, ones that travel to more off the beaten path. They're usually a little bit more casual. They're usually a little bit smaller. Might be things like the Amazon River. Uh, might be something that uh, in Costa Rica, something that has a little bit more adventure, uh, some spirit to it, and it's really about the destination. And then river cruise ships, as I mentioned, uh, one of the fastest growing um, types of cruising. River cruise ships ply the waters throughout Europe, and of course most popular is the, the Danube river cruises, but uh, the river cruise ships are also uh, the Yangtze River in, in China. Uh, they're now in uh, visiting uh, Cambodia and Vietnam, so uh, uh, many opportunities as far as river cruise ships in Europe and beyond. Once you've picked the ship you're going on, then it's the decisions still aren't done. It's uh, picking your stateroom type. So if you're on a bigger ship, you're going to have a lot of choices as the type of stateroom, whether you are having a stateroom with your own private balcony or veranda, whether you have a room with a window, or whether you have what is referred to in the cruise business as an inside cabin. Anybody want to guess what the inside cabin might be? It doesn't have a window. So an inside cabin does not have a window. Uh, so the stateroom sizes uh, do not vary tremendously, like a, a standard inside room without a window to a room with a window. But the big difference is the daylight. I, you know, we usually recommend people at least look at a room with a window, but you know, it all depends on your budget as well. So um, inside, no source of natural light. You turn off the light and it is dark. Um, outside has a window, of course, as I mentioned, and then balconies and suites. Uh, when you're selecting your stateroom, an interesting fact is, is that the least amount of movement on a ship, especially the big ships, the least amount of movement is lower on the ship, uh, on the lower decks, and in the middle of the ship, right? Not too far forward, not too far back. That's the least amount of movement. And I say this even knowing that the cruise lines have, um, with stabilizers are, you know, unless there's a storm, it's pretty stable and you don't feel a lot of motion. But least amount of movement is on lower decks midship. But historically, you think about historically and the transatlantic crossings, where was the most expensive rooms? They're at the top of the ship. The highest you go, they're at the top of the ship. That still holds true today. So pricing-wise, the higher up on the ship you are, the higher the deck, the more expensive the stateroom on board. So even though lower amount, lots of people would prefer the lower decks because of movement, um, you want a nicer room or a balcony, you're probably going to be on a little bit higher deck. So other details as you're starting to plan your trip. So you've picked your, your destination, your cruise, your ship and stateroom. 
Uh, but there's a lot of other details and I wanted to share those with you to just make sure you are making an informed decision. So first of all, for activities, shore excursions uh, are the t uh, what they call what you do when you arrive at a port of call. So you're on your cruise ship, you're cruising uh, during the evening and night, and the next morning you wake up and you're in Venice, Italy, or maybe you're on an Alaska cruise and you wake up in Juneau, Alaska. And the ship might be there from eight in the morning till five at night. It might be there even longer into the evening. So what is there to do? Right? Your ship just arrived, you can walk off the ship and start exploring. So you can wander off the ship on your own, start exploring. The cruise line will also offer a number of the most popular sightseeing trips that you can purchase from them and go out on a tour for the day. So you know, perhaps in Juneau, you want to go and visit Mendenhall Glacier, which is right on the outskirts of town and the ship will have a shore excursion that will take you out to Mendenhall Glacier, uh, visit the, the ranger headquarters there and things. If you're in Venice, Italy, maybe you want to go to St. Mark's Square, and the ship will have a shore excursion that takes you into St. Mark's uh, Square. We can see all the pigeons and everything else. <laughs> uh, the shore excursions are optional, so it allows you the chance to pick and choose what you want to do. There is an extra cost to them, and then, um, if, like I said, if you'd like to just explore on your own, you can do that as well. Just wander off the ship and explore on your own. Just be sure to be back before the ship sails. Very key. Um, so on shore excursions, typically for most of the cruise lines, it's an extra cost. Some of the uh, more luxury ships include them for no additional charge. And on the river cruising, it's uh, in most cases no additional charge. There's also, when you're just on the cruise, onboard facilities like the pool, the spa, there's shopping on board, there's casinos, fitness areas, a, a number of activities. And then in the evening, uh, onboard entertainment. They do, uh, the larger ships have large production shows like Broadway style shows, um, music, dance. They might have comedians, they might have a magician. It's really kind of some fun entertainment at night. They'll do multiple shows. If you're on a smaller ship, I have to be honest, the shows are more limited. Uh, you know, I was on a, I've been on a couple river cruises, you know, where maybe there's only a hundred people. You know, there's no big production show of song and dance. It might be one crew member gets up and speaks for 20 minutes and maybe about uh, his um, expertise in a destination. Uh, it might be like a professor or something like that. But, so if, you, if the number one thing for you is entertainment and you want to be entertained the whole time you're on your cruise, you want to choose a big ship. Uh, if you're looking for something more about the destination and uh, you, know, you don't care about the shows, then the small ships sometimes are better. So dining choices. This is probably um, everybody hears about uh, cruising and they talk about cruising and one of the first things they talk about is all the food, right? So there's a lot of choices for dining. Uh, for breakfast, uh, lunch, dinner, there's a very casual main restaurant that's a buffet style. So in many big ships, it's now open 24 hours a day, so you can always grab a quick casual meal. For dinner in the evening, the main dining room, which is a more formal dining room, you know, sit down, wonderful menu, multiple courses. You have typically now like a fixed, uh, your choice of having a fixed time to dine or you can dine at uh, what they call open. So go in any time into the main dining room between five and nine. Uh, typically you're sitting with other passengers. There are some tables for two though, so if you'd like. Uh, but typically you're sitting with other passengers and it's a really fun way to meet new people and hear everything about what everybody else did in port that day. There is room service, it's typically 24 seven. So if you ever need a quick bite and you just don't feel like leaving your room, that's an option. And a lot of the cruise lines today are, have added something they refer to as specialty restaurants. And I bring this up because I think it's always good to be aware if you're planning a cruise, specialty restaurants are uh, really smaller restaurants, quite intimate, maybe that seats only 40, 50 people, and this could be even on one of those ships that have thousands of passengers. So a very small restaurant, 
just really the tops in service and the quality of the food. And it's a really a fun experience. It's usually a much more formal dinner. But as a result of this limited venue and this really high level of dining and service, there's usually a service charge or a cover charge to go into that dining room. So I bring that up because a lot of the cruise lines are offering it now. And people are starting to think they're paying for all their dining on board. And you're, you're really just paying for those specialty restaurants, if you even choose to dine in them. I do like to myself, at least once during a cruise, go have a special evening, especially if you're celebrating something. It's kind of fun, but uh, it's an option for people. So if you're looking at a cruise, what's a good value? Because there's a, a tremendous amount of terms that get thrown around, especially in advertising and postcards you might get in the way, uh, mail. Uh, discounts is, you know, there's often discounts noted. There's early booking discounts. Um, there's something we call fire sales, which are, you know, it's uh, typically about two to three months before a cruise departs when all of a sudden the cruise line panics a little uh, if they're not sold out. So uh, the misnomer here is a lot of people think if they wait till the week prior, they'll get the fire sale. The cruise line doesn't want to wait till the week prior to fill the ship. They want it to be full about two to three months in advance. So they don't want to have to, they don't want a discount, first of all, to sell it, you know. So they try to um, fill it at, you know, at the minimum of two to three months in advance. And uh, um, so the discounts are taken off the, you know, published fares in the brochure. Um, a lo lot of terms you hear is upgrades. So you hear about, you know, you can get an upgrade or, or book one type of room, get an upgrade. So that's back when we were looking at the stateroom types. Maybe you decided to book, uh, you know, a room with a balcony, but they have a promotion right going on right now. And instead of the standard size, you get a, can get upgraded to a mini suite. So that's a common uh, type of thing offered. So if you like the idea of being in a nicer room than what you paid for, it might be nice to look for the upgrade term. Amenities and shipboard credit is very popular today. Uh, the amenities is um, just little added extras. So book your cruise and you're gonna get all of these little added extras. And they might be a specialty dining credit. It might be a bottle of champagne. The shipboard credit is uh, like shipboard spending money, basically. It provides you a set dollar amount that you can use toward expenses on board the ship. So you'll see those terms used in all sorts. Uh, not often are they combinable, but sometimes you can get shipboard credit and a discount or shipboard credit, credit and an upgrade. So just look for those or go back to my like slide four, which is enlist the help of a travel professional to help you weed through all of the terms. So the shipboard account, I mentioned shipboard credit. And this question comes up often if you haven't cruised before, but it, it's really like uh, if you're staying at, if you haven't cruised before and you've stayed at a hotel, you know, you go, you're at the hotel, you go to the restaurant at the hotel, you don't have to pay for it on the spot, you just charge it to your room. So it's the same on the cruise. So you, on the cruise lines, on the ships, they do not want any sort of cash changing hands throughout the cruise. They're not even set up to take payment on the spot. So they operate everything onto your shipboard account. So at the beginning of the cruise, you're going to register a credit card, and you'll make purchases throughout the cruise. Maybe you order a bottle of wine. Maybe you go to the spa. Maybe you buy one of those shore excursions. It just gets all added to your shipboard account. And um, before you disembark at the end, they give you a receipt, and you can double check, make sure you're, you think it's correct. I would save your, each time you buy something, they'll give you a receipt. You might want to save those in a special spot so you can compare when you get your final bill. One other tip um, I'll just throw in here is that when you're registering for your shipboard account, and you know what, this is something that goes, is true for hotels, it's true for rental cars. Um, if you're registering a credit card, they're going to put a hold um, on your account. If you're registering a debit card, it's the same. So we usually recommend only using a credit card and making sure that you understand how much of a hold they're going to put onto your account. It's just like when you check into a hotel, you may not have realized it, but they're going to put a hold on your credit card 
for the estimated room charges. And you could decide, have decided to pay by cash, but if your credit card can't hold that uh, temporary hold, you might get a message from the front desk. So uh, just as a um, little tip, make sure, we usually, like I said, recommend using credit cards over debit cards for travel like this. So additional costs to consider when you're planning a cruise is, of course, the cruise lines are, um, do not own the airlines, so the air is not included, and you do want to make sure you're accounting for airfare to and from your cruise. And the cruise lines will uh, have airfare packages, or you can purchase air independently. It used to be that when the cruise lines um, arranged your air, they you know, frankly, years ago, the cruise lines were getting a much better deal from the airlines, and they were able to bundle the air and cruise together. Today, the cruise lines are really not getting anything different on the air than you could get directly yourself. So it really has opened up this option to give you to just purchase air independently. And if you have a particular airline you're trying to earn points on or miles or you have a particular schedule you want then by all means you know arrange that you can arrange it independently and you can still be the purchase the transfer so the cruise line will meet you at the airport and take you to the ship uh, as i mentioned earlier in the presentation whenever you're arriving for a cruise we always recommend getting in one day early you don't want to run the risk of the flight being delayed because the ship might sail, right? So um, we do always recommend flying in one day early when you are departing on a cruise. Other costs to consider, gratuities on board the ships. Uh, so there's a tremendous number of staff that are gonna wait on you in the dining room, in your stateroom. They make up your room twice a day. So gratuities can add up anywhere between 10 and $15 per person per day. and uh, not all cruise lines do this, but many of them are now putting those on your shipboard account. So you don't have to sit here and save cash till the end of the cruise and hand it out to people. Not all cruise lines do that. Some of the nicer lines are inclusive of gratuity and they do not expect you to tip anything on top of the cruise fare that you already paid. Beverages, coffee, teas, water, uh, juices, milk, no charge on most cruise lines. Uh, uh, the other um, wine, sodas, beer is uh, typically a charge, unless you're on a, more of a luxury cruise line or uh, they're included. So if you kind of think of it this way, so the majority of cruise lines, it's not included, but the moment you start moving up in the type of cruise to a luxury ship, uh, it's, you've probably paid a little bit more t for your cruise to begin with, you typically wine, beer, sodas are included. And then, of course, plan for, if you're planning your budget for your trip, plan for anything you, else you want to do. Trips ashore, visits to the spa, shopping for everybody you left back home, souvenirs, all those things. So gambling, um, so all sorts of additional costs just to consider as you're budgeting for your trip. So finally, uh, some packing tips and documentation. So daytime attire, very casual. Uh, evening attire on a lot of the larger ships they do have a couple more formal nights so you might want a jacket or tie or a nice dress um, you might see some people with um, you're gonna see some men with tuxedos even so if you enjoy dressing up it's your night to do so lots of times they'll take have a photographer and they'll do uh, formal portraits that night so it's kind of fun you're all dressed up to have a portrait taken uh, on the more casual ships, smaller ships, uh, river boats, um, they have steered to a little bit being more casual. No, um, maybe no real dress up nights, no tuxedos. You might still want a jacket, especially if you're in Europe. Uh, you might want to have a jacket because if you ever think about d dining out at night, a lot of the nicer restaurants, most of the Europeans are going to dress up a little bit more than we do here. So whatever you're doing, just dress for the occasion and dress for the destination. Make sure that if you're planning on visiting some religious monuments, there might be certain restrictions. Maybe your shoulders need to be covered or your knees need to be covered when you go visit the Sistine Chapel. 
Uh, so, you know, make sure you know the destination that you're visiting and, and dress for the appropriate um, uh, occasion. So I went to Egypt a few years ago, and Egypt was one that they asked women to make sure they always covered their shoulders and didn't wear really short shorts and things like that. So, make, you know, just um, make sure you ask your travel professional if there's anything to be aware of for dress. If you're um, one of these um, that many of us are and has a hard time packing, uh, there is a packing expert. I think this sounds like the best job ever. So there is a packing expert, and her, uh, her name is Ann McAlpin, and she's actually been on the Today Show, the Oprah Winf Winfrey Show, and she can pack a suitcase like you would not believe. So I, I have adopted many of her tips, and so to the point now where I, I feel like I'm getting pretty good at it, and she has a presentation coming up at the Beaverton AAA on April 25 called Travel Smart Pack Light. And she will literally pack a, a suitcase in the 45 minutes she's in front of you and describe every step she's doing as she's doing it so you can go back home and practice yourself. Of course, everybody, the biggest mistake is they just pack too much, right? So, you know. But if, even if you have to want to pack a lot, you can do, still do it in a way that creates less wrinkles and is a little bit more efficient space-wise. And we can get you more information on that if you're interested. Uh, the sh many of the ships also offer laundry services. And uh, also, if you're packing, make sure you double check where you're going and what current they're on and if you need adapters for your plugs. So just a little tip. Uh, proof of citizenship and your documentation. You know, really today, a passport is required for almost all destinations. There are a couple um, uh, exceptions, but frankly, at this point, we're recommending a passport if you're traveling anywhere out of the country, even on a cruise that leaves from Seattle or leaves from Florida to like a Caribbean cruise, we're still suggesting a passport, and they are valid for 10 years. I would add that if you're planning to get a passport, you should plan for at least probably two months time at this point from the time if you don't have one now and you need to apply and get that one. Their typical running time is four to six weeks, but with some of the cutbacks currently, we are estimating that the time allowance to get a passport might be lengthened. So plan for ample time. Some destinations require a visa as well to enter a country. Um, uh, Brazil requires a visa. Um, I went to Russia several years ago. They required a visa. Usually you need to plan for um, obtaining that with about two to three months notice. And um, you can usually get them quicker. You just have to pay a hefty fee <laughs> for express fee. So we typically recommend making sure you just plan early and make sure you have time to obtain the visa. Uh, TSA.gov, the Transportation Security Administration, is a tremendous website with useful information. And then the State Department, um, uh, travel.state.gov, has uh, tremendous information for traveling overseas. And if you're traveling overseas, you can actually register with on the travel.state.gov website. You can actually register that you're going to be traveling overseas, what dates you're going to be gone, and where you're going to be going. Uh, for example, I went to Egypt in 2010, which was before most of the um, uh, situation happened there, but I registered on the State Department site before I went. Just because it was one of those destinations, I thought if anything was to happen, I want somebody to know where I am. So um, always a wise uh, uh, step. So safe sailing. Uh, travel insurance uh, is a... a Great uh, add-on if you are thinking once you book your trip, you may need to cancel for some reason due to a medical situation. Um, it's also going to cover you if you're out of the country. We recommend that you always check your own medical coverage and uh, your own health insurance to find out what happens if you're outside the U.S. Because if you have a situation uh, in Europe and you fall and break your arm and your health insurance doesn't cover you, you may be um, stuck with the bill. So there is um, other options and other travel insurance options. So we, again, just a, a tip, just make sure you check your coverage and make sure you have the appropriate coverage. Uh, there is on cruise ships, 
a doctor and nurse on board the ship, uh, and valuables, um, there is a safe inside your room. So just a couple of travel safety tips and cruise safety tips before we end. Uh, travel safety tips, uh, just always, I, I suggest, know your surroundings. And if you're in tourist areas or crowded areas, those are often targets. So it's always when you're in a, a destination. I'll never forget, I was in Florence, Italy a long uh, time ago, and it was taking a picture of the beautiful cathedral there, and... You, you know, every, nobody's looking at their handbags. Nobody's looking down. They're all looking up. And they're all holding their cameras, looking up, taking pictures. And you could, yeah, you could start seeing, you know, other people. And I'm like, those aren't tourists. All of a sudden, other people wandering close to some of the people holding up, looking, looking up with their handbags, you know, completely open, you know, because they just took the camera out and never zipped it closed. So be aware of your surroundings. Know that tourist areas are crowded. There's a lot of tourists, and the, any local thieves know that. Uh, carry only the cash or valuables you need. I suggest leaving jewelry. I don't, you know, you don't really need a lot of flashy jewelry. Leave it home. Leave the expensive watch at home. I just carry what you need. Um, if you're going to carry a purse, carry it wisely. Uh, and uh, you know maybe a crossbody purse uh, or carry something that is you know fairly secure. Keep your credit cards in your sight at all times. You go to a shop and you go to pay for your souvenir, and he takes your credit card. He goes into the back room for five minutes and comes back. Hard to say what happened. So usually credit card processing is right there at the cash register, not in a back room. So keep your eyes on your credit card. You know, dress conservatively, dress comfortably. So cruise safety, uh, as we like to say, don't leave common sense on the dock. Uh, the, um, don't leave your valuables lying around or use the stateroom safe. Uh, cruise industry places safety, security of passengers at the top. There's been a tremendous amount of news lately about the incident with uh, Carnival, especially last month with the Carnival Triumph in the... In the um, Caribbean Sea with the people stranded for days, you know, I feel horribly uh, for those people and the, what they had to live through, I can't even imagine. But I will say that I, I don't own stock in Carnival, but they did keep the safety of the, the passengers as the number one mission. And nobody came away injured or hurt. Now, they certainly did not have a good cruise and there's, you know, yeah, no excuse for that, but um, they do place safety and security at the top. And I would add that there's about, like I mentioned earlier, about 220 ships plying the North American waters. In 2013, they expect about 20 million Americans will be going on a cruise in 2013. So while I uh, take pity on the people that were on the Carnival Triumph, at least it was a small percentage of overall cruise passengers that were affected. So, uh, exercise caution when eating, drinking ashore. On the ship, you really don't have to worry, but if you, um, a lot of people are lulled into a sense of security on the ship, and then they walk off into Mexico for the day, and they forget it's not the same level of sanitation as it is on the ship, and they start drinking the water, not such a good idea. So. Make sure you're exercising caution wherever you are. So two thirds of the Earth's surface is water. Um, it's uh, a fun way to wake up each day to a new port of call with only having to have unpack once. It's a great value. And like I said at the beginning, we invite you to imagine a destination, maybe think about planning a celebration and to try something new. So with that, uh, and I think we will open it up maybe for some questions or yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. This was great and I myself have been on I think six cruises, so I you were you were spot on. All right questions Is this on yeah, I'm Bill Kroger forum member I, I just want to tell you when I was in the south of France a year before last I had on a pair of shorts and got on a trolley car and little kids unzipped my pants pocket, took my wallet out, took all the money out of it, put it back in, 
I couldn't believe it. You know, I got off the thing and I realized my my thing was unzipped here, and I looked down, and all my money was gone, $200. Well, and I would say at least, it sounds like they left maybe ID. Yeah. Or, and so <laughs> in one respect, at least they only took the cash. I, but it's amazing with crowds, people don't realize, because they feel people bumping up to them, what, could, what people could be doing or ha what could be happening yeah. to your pockets. Who, who would have thought little kids? Just, I mean, yeah. these kids were like this big. I don't. I was told by the police. I didn't report it like that, but I was told at the hotel that that they they don't take a lot of credit cards and stuff anymore because the security is just too is too much of a hassle for mm -hmm. them. Anyway, my question is: is you had mentioned Carnival Cruise, but I was wondering from your vantage point if the if the, all the problems with the Carnival Cruises has impacted the industry overall. Uh, okay, thanks, Bill. So, what we're seeing. So the question is uh, impact on the cruise industry. We're not uh, seeing. Uh, a negative effect now on, uh, you know, repeat cruisers. People who have cruised before haven't been, uh, you know, convinced otherwise. They're still cruising. What we don't understand but do expect is that first-time cruisers, the person who hasn't cruised before but is thinking about it, may delay. They'll, they'll, they're going to keep thinking about it. They're not going to take that cruise yet. And that's what we're seeing, and there is tremendous industry analysts far more uh, educated on this topic than myself, but it, it is a, a, a concern that those first-time cruisers will delay. But with that said, um, there's a, we have 20 mi million people cruising. There's enough cruisers out there that will keep on cruising. I don't think it's gonna negatively impact uh, uh, bookings as a whole. Uh, the carnival's going through some system upgrades and building in redundant systems. So financially, they're going to be affected. Their bottom line is going to be affected because of the amount that they're going to be putting into some systems. Yeah. Thank you, Mark Freiberg, forum member. Excuse my voice today. I uh, went on a cruise, the very uh, first one and the only one I've been on so far, a little more than a year ago. It was actually a wonderful experience. Everything you said. There was only one thing I changed, and I wanted to know if some are now offering this. You always had to be back on ship in the evening. I know why. That's how they make their money. But on the other hand, we would have paid a little more for the cruise if we'd been able to enjoy some nightlife on shore, that aspect of local color. Do any cruises ever offer that experience? They do. <laughs> and one of the most popular ones right now, so a cruise lines, and, and you're right, the majority of cruise lines do stay or in port till 5 or 6 in the evening, and then they depart. Uh, the one I'm thinking of right off the top of my head is Azamara Cruises. I actually traveled on them with a group of friends last summer, so experienced this firsthand. The thing that they are known for is what they call longer stays and more overnights. And on, it varies by itinerary. I was on a 12-day cruise in the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. And out of the 12 nights on the ship, I think six or eight of those nights, we were in port till midnight or uh, in some cases even later. And so it gave us the opportunity to have dinner ashore and really experience really kind of a little bit more of the evening ashore when all the locals came out. And you could totally tell the difference. I was in like Dubrovnik in Croatia. And all of a sudden by nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, the crowd changed, and it wasn't so many tourists, it was a lot of locals, and they were just out going to their restaurants or going wherever they're going for the evening, and it was a very a fun experience. So that is one, Azamara. Um, there are a few others that are starting to do that as well because of demand, mm -hmm. just like your own feelings, that wanting to stay overnight. Not They won't all go that way, though. It's very expensive because the cruise lines um, uh, yes, they, of course, okay. would like to make some money from passengers mm -hmm. on board the ship, but also they have to pay a far greater fee the longer the ship is tied up on dock. I see. Yeah. And, and just a follow-up question, too, and that is on the gratuity. We were on a gratuity-included package, but it was made abundantly clear to us that the staff expected oh, really? extra. Yeah. Is that, uh, was this a pushy staff, or was this just what it's expected now? You just give more. Uh, it could be a pushy staff. Mm -hmm. There are definitely, um, uh, it's a very confusing topic because mm -hmm. there's some cruise lines that say gratuity is all additional. Some say it's included, but you get there and it doesn't really seem like it's included. And then there's some cruise lines where it is very much 
you do not tip, you do not feel pressure. So it's just this varying degree. And so it would might be something where we could talk later and find out what you were on and you know suggest something different. Yeah, overall a wonderful experience. Yeah. Good. Thank you for coming. Good. Yep. Eric Squires, forum member. I picked my mom and her sister up from Seattle's uh, port and listened to a debriefing. And I was, as never, never, I've never cruised. So it was fascinating for me to hear a description of uh, NCL versus Carnival, because they'd been on multiple cruises. And I'm wondering if you can name names and tell me about personalities of cruise lines and uh, uh, if there's demographics that each one are specifically looking for. Okay, personalities of cruise lines. It's similar to the fact that there's personalities of hotels, right? So you're gonna have a different experience at the Four Seasons or the Ritz-Carlton than you're gonna have at the Super 8, okay? So there's you know, um, a large variance and uh, you know, um, I, I, there's so many cruise lines. I don't know that I could st where to start, but I would say that there are some some lines like a Carnival, like a NCL, which is definitely more of a mass market. And then you can move up to a, a cruise line like a Princess, a Holland America, a Celebrity, which is a little bit step above, where the quality of the service, the cuisine, the quality of the entertainment, a lot of times it's small things that you know really kind of add up to you can tell the difference. And then of course there's luxury cruise lines, um, Seaborn, um, Crystal Cruises that really take great pride in the service and a more refined level of service. And uh, you know it's it's really a, um, comes down to um, you know the the types of um, inclusions and the added amenities on board that differentiate one from another. Hi, Emily Nepp, I'm a member. I'm concerned about those folks that were stuck on the ship when it broke and they were out at sea and they were there for a very long time, it seems to me. And what we heard in the press about the compensation by the company to those people afterwards seemed pretty minuscule compared to what their grief was at the time. As a seasoned traveler with your experience, if you'd have been one of those folks stuck on the ship, is there anything else an individual could do to either get off the ship, be able to download, get their money back, whatever? Yeah, yeah I, and I don't, uh, it's a good question. So um, Carnival did uh, provide all of them a refund um, extra spending money, and then I think a future cruise. And I know there is been some legal actions now taken, so maybe there will be more. Um, I can't. I can't speak to that. Uh, I would add. I mean, uh, I. I don't know, I, frankly, how I would have felt if I was one of those people on the ship. I do travel with kind of an open spirit, and I travel with the notion that things aren't all going to go right. Uh, there's one thing you can count on, things don't all go right. And, uh, but I, I can't say specifically, I think, how I would have felt had I been on the ship. Uh, I would say that it would have been very difficult to have that number of passengers be offloaded in the middle of the sea in rough waters without a serious um, uh, uh, safety risk. Uh, and Having been on as many ships as I have, I can say that that was one thought I went through my head when I watched the media was they nobody understood why they just couldn't just pull up another ship and bring them off. Uh, that, that would have been very, very high risk situation. And I can't even imagine people trying to transfer from one ship to another in the middle of the sea with all of their luggage because they wouldn't have wanted to leave <laughs> any of it behind. So it, it's hard to say, yeah. Thank you, Kathy Stanton, for our member. Does AAA act as a broker on behalf of AAA members coming in to get information in the sense that you have a number of different lines for a particular destination? Uh, 45th anniversary is coming up. We are taking uh, my, my turn. We're gonna do the Alaska cruise. Mm -hmm. um, I checked out some books from the library um, on Alaska cruises and went, oh my God, I just wanna win somebody 
give me a ticket and I'll yeah. just take whatever they get because there are so many options out there. How does AAA help someone like myself without going through your checklist? This is not, I just want to yeah. go inland passage yeah. and see stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so um, at, um, at AAA, uh, we have, a, we're a full service travel agency as well. We our, our priority is our AAA members, but we actually will sell travel to non-members as well. And that was one of the slides about a listing a travel professional. So one of the things our travel team does is they talk to the potential um, a traveler and find out what you're looking for and then usually are able to kind of whittle it down to a couple recommendations. We do have, like when it comes to cruises, we do have what we refer to as our preferred cruise network. It's frankly 75% of the cruise lines are, are represented in our preferred cruise network where they've, we know the, the background of those cruise lines, we know they're that they are financially sound and we're not putting our members at risk financially. And you know we've done thorough checks and we know that they overall provide an excellent experience. So really we, um, we will sell a multitude. Now when it comes to Alaska, we might whittle that down further because we know there's a few cruise lines that actually have slightly better itineraries than others in Alaska. In Alaska, you're subject to visiting uh, uh, any national park. The, there's uh, Glacier Bay National Park, for example, it's the number one spot for many people to see. They only give out two permits to ships a day, which sounds like a lot, but when you count on how many cruise ships, 30, 40 ships in Alaska, they don't all get to vote, go into Glacier Bay. So that's where we immediately, when we start talking Alaska, and in our minds and our staff, we immediately start whittling it down because we try to put people on the best product for the best price possible, of course, but. <laughs> and last question, what would you recommend for cruising with grandchildren? Oh, cruising with grandchildren. I, um, I actually um, like the idea, frankly, of an Alaska cruise a lot of times for families, and the reason we, I do is there's convenient sailings round trip Seattle. So if there's a lot of grandkids and the idea of flying a long distance with them doesn't sound great, it's a pretty quick way to get to, Ala to Alaska just by driving to Seattle. So we do um, like that, and the ships have uh, children's facilities, mm -hmm. so there's lots of fun things for them to see and wildlife, mm -hmm. so fun. Warm destination, you know, Mexico, Caribbean is very popular as well. Uh, Mexico, maybe you only have to fly as far as Los Angeles, mm -hmm. which is, um, helps out. Again, shorter distance with kids. If the kids are a little bit older, teens or older, we're seeing um, some people um, taking them on this like, you know, life dream trip to Europe. And uh, there's quite a few families that will take their teens and older kids on a cruise to Europe, so all these things they've been reading about in their history mm -hmm. books for years and years, they actually finally get to see in person, so. Okay, yeah. good. All right, well, thank you, Dory. That was just I really appreciate it very much. <laughs> so thanks to Doreen and Holly and her other colleagues from AAA of Oregon. And thanks um, to all of you for being with us today. Next week at the Public Affairs Forum, that will be the 1st of April, April Fool's Day, we won't be fooling you. We will be bringing you candidates for the Tualatin Valley Water District Board and for the Beaverton School District Board, Zone 7. Um, April will be a month here at the Forum with lots of candidates for the spring election, which I believe is being held May 13th. Oh, May, 20, May 21st. All right. And thank you once again from your Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Goodbye. be a month here at the Forum with lots of candidates for the spring election, which I believe is being held May 13th? Oh, May, 20, May 21st? All right. And thank you once again from your Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Goodbye. be a month here at the Forum with lots of candidates for the spring election, which I believe is being held May 13th? Oh, May, 20, May 21st? All right. And thank you once again from your Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Goodbye. Okay.